planet as a responsible nation in terms of managing the climate. Next, let us look at the major watersheds in Sri Lanka. This is what we have. And if we can plan according to our watersheds, we may have a chance. And I will quickly show you a system that will allow us to do so. And if you plan for a watershed, we must understand what the aspects are. Is it abiotic, living things on the land or not? Concrete? Is it biotic? Are there living things? Is it open land? Is it forest land? Cultural? Etc. That way we can look at the components of a landscape. Let me illustrate. For instance, we take a landscape and we say, oh, there are living things on it, so we click biotic. And then we look at it, is it covered with trees or not? No, it's not, it's open land. We click open land. Oh, then we say, okay, is it cultural, traditional, or industrial? Is it cultural? You know, it's rice production. Then we ask, is it industrial or traditional? And as you see, it tells us what is on our landscape. And there are certain proportions of each we have to manage on each landscape if we are to make it sustainable. And why do we need to look at landscapes? Because in order to adapt to the changes, I spoke to you about temperature rising. If we want to adapt to the changes, we have to create anthropogenic systems, which we humans create, as climate responsive buffers to natural systems and corridors. What are these? I will come to this thing later on, but I will point out that if you have a group of trees or if you have a tree barrier, trees reduce the temperature, ambient temperature around them. If you have an agricultural system where the increase of one or two degrees will drop your production by 10 or 20 percent, by having tree cover that will drop the temperature by a couple of degrees will save you from that drop. That is designing, that is adapting, that is moving into the future that we have before us. Next, we should promote an economic model that values such actions, such as what we're talking about, the blue-green economy. I will dwell on that for a second. And the blue-green economy, UNEP says, you know, it's a, this is a economy that is interdependent and self-sustaining. And improvement in line with the blue-green economy would include economic diversification, etc. If we look at a blue-green economy in practical terms, what do we see? I propose that a blue-green economy would mean transitioning from a hydrocarbon-driven economy, which we have today, driven by oil, coal, um, fossil fuels, these are all hydrocarbons. So it means transitioning, moving from a hydrocarbon driven economy to a carbohydrate driven one. Because photosynthesis fixes carbohydrates and that's what gives us our food, that's what gives us our energy, that's what gives us our health. So in simple terms, that's what a blue-green economy would be transitioning from a hydrocarbon driven economy into a carbohydrate driven one. Next. A blue green driven economy in that case will recognize the value of primary productivity. And a blue green economy will maintain a high B to B ratio, biodiversity to biomass ratio. I'll talk about this a little later. Now, how can the blue-green economy generate revenue. This is the bottom line. Here we are. We'd like to do a lot of things. But quite often, it's difficult to do lots of things if you don't have the resources to do it. And I'd like to propose that in this blue-green economy, we can generate revenue by placing a value on primary productivity by enabling nations to capitalize on their stocks of photosynthetic biomass. I'm going to talk about this a little in a minute. Through the payment of ecosystem services, we are all agreed that ecosystem services are important and should be paid for. And
end by providing for the goals set by the international convention systems, the sustainable development goals, the convention on uh, biological diversity, the commission on sustainable development, the convention to control desertification, etc., etc. Okay. Now I'd like to present to you, I'd like to enter into the crux of what I'm going to do, and I'm going to show you a substance, a thing, a way, in which we can change from our current economy, hydrocarbon driven, into a carbohydrate driven one. It's easy. Most of you learnt this when you went to high school. When you were 16 years old, you would have learnt this stuff. It's common sense. As a scientist, I hate things that are complicated. If it's common sense, if I can explain it to a kid, that makes sense. Okay, let me bun launch into this. The gain in biotic carbon or biomass, and we're talking about you know, carbon in trees or whatever, is defined as the net primary productivity, NPP. This basically is photosynthesis. Sunlight, water, carbon dioxide, and life. Within the leaf of a plant, can capture the solar energy, give us oxygen to breathe, and give us food. That's photosynthesis. That's net primary productivity. This is the basis of life on this planet. Net primary productivity. Okay. Now, it tells us how much biomass we can occur, grow, in any place, at any time, and it'll tell you how much. Now, ecosystem services are provided by ecosystems, obviously. The more biomass it contains, remember, net primary productivity means the creation of biomass. Okay. The more biomass it contains, the higher the volume of services provided. Biomass is accumulated through a process called serial succession. In nature, as you can see, if you leave a forest, you know, cut and open, first the grasses will grow, then the small bushes will grow, then the larger trees will grow, the pioneer trees will grow, and finally there will be a forest with large biomass. This is called serial succession. Now, primary productivity is this most important thing. And in terrestrial ecosystems, on land, it is performed by the photosynthetic biomass, which is the leaves of plants. It, in the end, it is the leaves of the plants and trees we see around us that gives us the oxygen to breathe, the food to eat, the water to drink. And it's valuable, but it has a unique value. The unique value of photosynthetic biomass is that it can only retain that value as long as it is living. So a leaf on a tree is critically important as long as it is living on that tree. It has value. You pluck the leaf, no value. This is the interesting thing of photosynthetic biomass, the thing that keeps this whole planet alive. And then let's look at the stock of what we have on this planet. Standing stock of photosynthetic biomass in the forest is about 29.3 billion, in the grasslands and open land about 60, in marine 3. Well, we have an approximate global total of about 93.1 gigatons of photosynthetic biomass as the total of what is keeping us alive and healthy on this planet today. And, tragically, this is what is happening to it. FAO shows us that the declines in carbon in living biomass is now almost exponential. It's crashing. I would like to propose that it's doing so because we haven't put any value on this most important and this most valuable part of nature 
the leaves of trees. When we do carbon measurements and carbon trading, what do we do? We look at the trunks of the trees and look at the carbon in it. We throw the leaves aside. When you do forestry and, and timber extraction, what do we do? We look at the timber in the trees, throw the leaves aside. The living leaves, which is the most important thing on this planet, we haven't given one penny of value to. Is it a wonder that we are suffering the way we are suffering today? And what can these things do? Let me illustrate some things that the leaves do for us on this planet. One, they cool the ambient environment around us. One tree, large tree, has leaves that gives us a cooling factor about 10 AC units working eight hours a day, which is about 1,200,000 British thermal units. If you look at what happened when we removed the trees on this planet, I looked at the figures from 1947. We lost 750 million hectares of forest. That means that today, we have lost, because of that, we have lost a cooling factor of over that number per day on this planet. We're talking global warming, huh? This is what we lose when we have lost the forest of this earth. There is something else. Clouds. Clouds, all clouds on this planet are made by two in two areas. One is made over the oceans by a thing called dimethyl sulfide. It's a, it's a molecule because there's water above us in the sky. But the thing is, it cannot condense. And if it does not condense, clouds don't form. To condense, it requires a cloud condensation nucleus, small particle around which water will condense. Over the ocean, those things are, are given out by a thing called EMS, dimethyl sulfide. Dimethyl sulfide is, is produced by the phytoplankton of the ocean. You all know what it is when you go by your ocean, take a deep breath, you smell it fishy, that's dimethyl sulfide. Over land, clouds are created by the aerosols that come from the leaves of plants and by the bacterial particles, pseudomonads and aerogenies that line the surface of all trees and plants and destomata. So when they evapotranspire, that goes out too. So those two things are what give us clouds over land. It has been estimated by CSIRO in Australia that if we increase our global albedo, the whiteness of our clouds, by 1 to 2 percent, it can diminish the warming effect of carbon dioxide by over 50 years. So there again is another reason why we should be valuing the leaves of our plants and our forests. There's another reason. Photosynthetic biomass cleans groundwater. All the groundwater around us, as soon as the rainwater hits the ground, it's, it's water, water is a universal solvent, it starts picking up stuff, it's polluted. Trees and plants pick up this polluted water from the ground, push it through their systems, and when it evapotranspires, it's pure, clean water. If not for trees and plants and the leaves, we will have no clean water to drink. And photosynthetic biomass, the leaves, they cycle the atmospheric water reservoir at a rate of about 9,000 billion tons of photosynthetic cycle. It could be a week, it could be 10 days. This is what trees and plants do for us. Finally, the most important thing is Photosynthetic biomass, the trees and plants, it is the only production system that maintains the global oxygen cycle. The air we breathe. We breathe fossil oxygen given out by a plant sometime somewhere in the past. All the oxygen we breathe were created by plants somewhere. 
And as we reduce the photosynthetic biomass, we reduce the amount of oxygen replenishment into our atmosphere. So, in summary, the ecosystem services of terrestrial photosynthetic biomass that has to be considered in any adaptation approach to climate change has to be cleaning of groundwater, provision of oxygen, cooling ambient environment, sequestering carbon dioxide. Remember, this is what we are paying the millions and millions of dollars for today, for sequestering carbon dioxide. It is just one function of photosynthetic biomass. Contributing to cloud condensation nuclei and cycling the global atmospheric water reservoir. This is the value of terrestrial photosynthetic biomass. Now, what has the economist got to say about the value? 